problem where commitments break down again. Because shit happens, right? I get off at one. I get off at one. Uh, twelve forty, right? Is what I said. So then I've got to go and run down the street. So I'm running down the street. Maybe I get off a little bit late, but then there's a traffic jam. And now what? Now what's going to happen? I'm going to be late. But I made a commitment. So there's a conundrum here. There's a problem. So what should happen if that happens? You should call them. You gotta call them and say, hey. When should I call them? Right now. As soon as you realize. As soon as you realize. What typically happens? Here's your here's your hot dog. It's two o'clock. It's two o'clock. Man. Well, you know, I got off late because my boss, and then I went the street, and there was an accident, and then I got to the place, and they, hey, by the way, they were at a mustard, so I got you ketchup, and and now what is the requester thinking? This guy's a useless kid. I don't trust him. He can't fulfill. So, and to some degree, he has a reason to feel that way, because we made a commitment. Now, what typically happens, again, if we go back all the way, we don't, we're not clear and specific. The guy doesn't negotiate. Then he goes to perform. He runs into adversity. He makes up, there's, there's very, it's ambiguous, so he makes up his own way to do it. And he comes back. And he makes a bunch of excuses, and the guy says, well, why didn't you do it this way, and this way, and this way? And he said, well, first I didn't know, and then I, because I start making excuses, and so this, the trust really breaks down. So the appropriate response during the performance is to, whenever you encounter adversity that requires, that will in, uh, not allow you to fulfill the specific Request of the requester, it's the performer's responsibility to notify the requester, renegotiate the commitment as soon as they know there's a problem. Now, if one, if I have a, if this is our commitment that we just made the hot dog, and I'm supposed to get off at 12.40 to go, and I get off at, say I get off at 12.45, uh, and I jump in the car, and I realize there's traffic, and I call you and say, hey, I left, I had to leave a little late. I'm in traffic. There's a huge accident here. I'm going to be late. I don't know how long it's going to take me. When I get there, I'll give you a call back. And then, so we can kind of reevaluate, find out what time I can actually bring this hot dog. Is that okay? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, whenever you get back. Great. Or would you prefer me not to go and maybe just grab something? The like, we can renegotiate that commitment, right? And how are you going to feel about that? Aware. You're going to feel, I mean, you look, yeah. I, you know, you're a reasonable man. You know that stuff comes up. I can't control the traffic. And if I let you know in the moment that I can't control the traffic, and this is going to, uh, the commitment's important to me, so I'm calling you now to let you know that there may be a holdup and ask you if there's something else we can, you'd like me to do to, 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 to yeah. accomplish something else, and you have an opportunity to change the direction of the request, so it can be fulfilled more to your liking, you're going to be okay with that. Yeah, appreciation, appreciation of being included in the decision. That's right. You're going to say, well, it's not his fault. Mm -hmm. we're, we're going to work through it, and we're going to make a change, and then we're going to, we're going to, again, he'll have a chance to perform the renegotiated request. So at what point does renegotiated request become an excuse? Well... I think renegotiated requests become excuses when A, they're not done in the moment, or B, they're done too frequently by the same performer. Repeated. They're repeated. Right? If you have a performer who okay. consistently makes clear specific requests that they negotiate, and then they always have a problem performing, then you have a, you have a, you have a culture or a person problem. More likely a person problem. 
Now, the way you can tell if you have a person problem is that you make clear and specific negotiated commitments with other people, and they tend to not have problems performing. And so, but they all that perform fine. This guy performs terribly all the time. Always renegotiating, always making excuses, right? Because there's also performing well and performing poorly. Performing poorly is they don't do it and they make excuses at the end. They don't call you immediately, all that. Now, the guy calls immediately every time, well, at least he's trying. But if he's someone who constantly runs into problems, he's probably not resourceful enough to be re responsible for these kinds of commitments that you're, you're giving. Okay. So, key for in performance. Keep in contact with the requester and as soon as there, make contact with the requester as soon as there's an a, a obstacle that would require, that might derail the performance and renegotiate the commitment. The final stage. Seems like it's over here, doesn't it? <laughs> like, you made a commitment, negotiated a commitment, performer performs the commitment. But there's actually another step. The acceptance phase. This is where the requester accepts the performance and the fulfillment of the commitment. So in the initial example, I bring you the hot dog. I did not renegotiate. I'm on time. It's there. You say, hey, Chicago hot dog, mustard, no peppers, napkins, Coke, 1215, or whatever, 115, perfect, thank you. They accepted the commitment, the, the fulfillment of the commitment, and it's acceptable. You fulfilled my request in an acceptable manner. Good job. Or, well, you're here on time, got the hot dog, got the napkins, no peppers, got the Coke, but there's no mustard on here. Not a big deal, but you missed the mustard. So next time, just Get my mustard. Be a little bit more cognizant. Yeah. Don't miss the mustard, right? I accept it, but I'm letting you know it wasn't perfect. Or, hey man, no mustard here. I need you to go get me some mustard. And you say, well, that's kind of weird. That's kind of an asshole. Well, no, you made a commitment. I need the mustard's not here, so the commitment is not fulfilled. So better go get the. Better go get the mustard, right? Still need the mustard. Because the commitments matter, right? We, we were clear and specific. You negotiated. You performed. You didn't let me know there was any problems. You didn't tell me, call me when you were there and tell me they were out of mustard. We didn't renegotiate the commitment. So I'm expecting the mustard because that's what you committed to. <laughs> And so now you can say, listen, this is good, but I need the mustard. Go get the mustard. When the mustard get, comes back, then the commitment is accepted, and then the commitment is over. The more the likelihood you want someone back, you accept it. That's the problem. That's if that, and that is a problem. If you consistently accept poor, com, poorly fulfilled com, com, commitments, then you're basically allowing people to perform poorly, and that's not okay. Now, if you, it was unclear, well, then, then you realize, well, that was my fault in the clarity of the commitment, and I'll try to do better there. But you need to tell this person, you need to do better in the performance of the commitment. And quite frankly, uh, before I'm going to, this commitment's over, before you get, we're done here, you have to go get me that mustard because I want the mustard, and you committed to it. And that's what a commitment looks like. You do, you do it until it's done. When we were in a large group, I'm talking number of stories reflect the requester and the performer at the time of the performer we were coached as management and this is a very uncomfortable thing but can you repeat that back to me please and then we knew right there if it was a long task they would write it down 
what we did was we, we stressed the point of, and I'm talking this in deployment at 7,000 employees, and at all levels, it was always asked the same of all of us to communicate the same way. I'm just way down here, but my people below me. And it was a really big thing, and our reason for it behind it was we were trying to stress the fact if we did, Kristen did something that I should have done, how much wasted time for a, a month, a day, and we backed it up that way, and it was a very powerful way, and it was a non-threatening way, because sometimes I know with my kids, I might boom, 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 and here says what I want done, but I haven't done it out my lips, and when I ask them to repeat, repeat it back to me, then I know I've spoke clearly to them, so if you want to back the process up a little bit. It's really important to make sure that you verbalized stuff. everything that you expect. And that, look, again, this the request has got to be clear and specific, and there has to be negotiation. And really, the responsibility here falls on both parties right. to do really both pieces. And I, I always say, the person who's most responsible is the person who most understands the model. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So it's important to teach this to your people so that they're familiar with it. And then, obviously, people have different levels of, of learning and ability. understanding and even ability. So it's the, really the person who's got the biggest, best command of the process who should lead the process. And I know this sounds, it seems very pedantic, maybe uh, mechanical to do this. But as you do, the more you do it mechanically, the better you get at doing it organically. And it really needs to start mechanical before it becomes organic. But this is what is required for people to actually make commitments that can be fulfilled. And it's through making proper commitments and having your people fulfill those commitments to each other that you're actually going to be able to create trust in an organization that will even allow you to have conflict because this is, there's really almost a form of <coughs> subtle conflict here. When you request something and the other person negotiates, knowing that they have the opportunity, actually they, they, have, a they have the need, they have to negotiate the commitment, it almost is allowing them to have a conflict in a, in, by skillful means in a, in a simple, low risk manner because that's what they're supposed to do. So then it almost trains them to be able to have larger conflict later. And because this ultimately then fosters more trust amongst the team, they feel more comfortable having conflict later when it comes to like negotiating like maybe an idea, like and pushing and pulling, I have this idea. Well, that's not really gonna work for us because, which they would normally not do that. They would just say, yeah, fine. And then back, they would, what, they, what, we, what happens is what you get is backdoor, uh, back channel communication where in a meeting we have, we talk about something, you say M X Y Z. I don't have conflict with you, I just agree. And then at lunch I go here with these people and say, man, that guy is such a jerk. He said X, Y, and Z, and I don't think it should be that way, and blah, 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 blah. But I never told you that when we were talking because I was afraid. I didn't want to have conflict. So I'm afraid to have conflict with you, but I'm more than willing to talk about how I actually feel with people over here that have nothing to do with this situation or scenario. And so that's why, that's why the inability to have conflict is so damaging to a team is because it creates these back channel communication uh, pockets where you, we're, we're not on the same page because I'm afraid to have conflict with you. I'm basically talking bad about you or your idea behind your back and poisoning these people's mindset about your idea and your, your, your program before you even have a chance to get it off the ground. Yeah, you know, some kids come to mind and that's like your employees, they don't really want to play tic-tac-toe. Given the opportunity, they'd rather play chess. They, they want to be, so yeah, my detail guy, I might be very specific because I don't trust them to squat, but like you or something, I'm going like, you know, you're you're one of my up-and-comers, you know, you're a creative and a real cool guy, I, I trust you. And, um, I, I just see if you can wow me. If, if I just gave them a, does that ever have a place where some people get you lunch and you just go, I don't know, just, you're a creative, cool guy, and I trust you. Just, just, just see if you can wow me. Well, if and then that creates the idea of like now I've got to figure out what the wow is about. And instead of giving, the, if everything's always so specific, 
it just chuck, 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 chuck. I feel like people feel like they're motivated to always play a tic-tac-toe. I think when you have talented and creative people, you almost want to give them the latitude and say, wow, me, I trust you. It depends on what it is. There's difference. There is a difference to that. Like, so if you know that you have a person who is capable and you're okay with flexibility in the acceptance phase of the commitment, then you can, but you realize that you're not asking for you. The commitment is very, is very vague. So if they just come back with anything, you've got to be happy with that. You've got to be okay with that. Or if there's certain parameters, but there's other things that are flexible, make sure you set certain parameters are very clear and, and identified. If this guy doesn't even come in for close to wowing me, then next time I'll just give him this thing. But, but to give people the opportunity to be creative and think for themselves and think outside the box. So let's, you can wow me. Let's, let's talk about it because it, it's important. Let's, let's go a little deeper and let's put an example on it. So let's say you're trying, you want, because at higher level people, you don't really want to tell them what to do. Yeah. You want to tell them the result. The re- what result you want. You okay? out, but the result... The clear, the clarity around the result is the commitment. Okay, so here's what I want, Joe. We got to make this department more productive. I think that in a week from now, or let's let's call it a month from at the end of the month, we need to be at, we need to have uh, 150 contracts written. Okay, and those 150 contracts should equate to. Uh, Gross sales of between four hundred and four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay, that's what I want. So by the thirtieth, I want hundred at least one hundred and fifty contracts with gross sales around four hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand. Okay, how you get there, I don't care. Is that if you accept that commitment and you have an up? So is that okay with you? Is there? You think that's possible? I, I might have things I want to run by. I think if you give me the latitude to do what I need to do, yeah, I think I can get three thousand for one fifty. I think I can do that. Well, I will be one hundred percent available to you for any questions or input. <clears throat> I can, uh, and you know, based on my current office hours, when you, I'm open X, Y, and Z times, you can come in any of those times. Ask me whatever you need to ask me. Okay. If you're, I'll, I'll submit to you then tomorrow what I think it'll take to get there, and if you'll approve it, I'll be responsible for this. Okay, so if I approve your plan tomorrow, then by the 30th, we'll get there. you will have 150 or more contracts delivered with, with gross sales between 450 to 500,000. Is that correct? I can do it. Great. So we made the commitment with flexibility, right? But you can't say, hey, this guy's really creative, this guy's good. You know what I want you to do? I want you to improve this department. Wow me. Wow me, baby. Because it's just not enough. I mean, (laughs) there's got to be some parameters that allow this guy to succeed or not succeed. Because the too vague means there can't be any, there's not a commitment and there's no accountability. Because he shows up at any point in time with anything, he says, I did it. Well, you say, no, you didn't really, you didn't wow me. You didn't really produce what I was expecting. You didn't do it in a good enough time frame. But none of that was said. But you didn't even give it a result. And that the doings fall where they may. Now, you got somebody to trust. Certain people, you can, be, you can give that kind of latitude. Okay. Other people need more, yes. more specifics. Like the detail guy. <laughs> like the detail guy, right? But even the detail guy needs to have the opportunity to negotiate the commitment. Yes. Okay? So... As long as this, you're clear and specific, and there's negotiation around the outcomes, the performer performs and lets you know if any renegotiation needs to happen in the moment, and then you get an opportunity to inspect and accept the performance, then a commitment has been made and fulfilled. The ambiguity between the, of the how really is about how willing you are to give the person, or how willing the requester is to give the person latitude in the in the process, in the performance. Like, I didn't tell him he needed to drive a, v- a car to the hot dog stand, or had to ride his bike to the hot dog stand, or what he had to wear while he was riding it. I didn't give, I didn't put any of those specifics in place. 
I, he could do whatever he wants to get the hot dog. He could have sent somebody else to get the hot dog. But when, if he doesn't deliver the hot dog, it's not the person he sent's fault. It's his fault. Because he made the commitment. I'm not telling him that he has to go personally. It's up to him. But the responsibility at the end of the day falls on his shoulders. So if he outsourced the task and it didn't go well, doesn't matter. I made a commitment with him. He agreed to the commitment. The commitment was a true commitment because it was clear and specific and was a negotiated. He didn't renegotiate with me through in the performance phase. And now here we are at the end and it's unfulfilled. He did not deliver. That's unacceptable. And it's, I believe that it's okay to, to hold people accountable and for commitments, unfulfilled commitments to be deemed un, un, uh, unacceptable if we actually made a real commitment. If you don't make a real commitment and then you hold a guy accountable, you, you, it's un, his performance is unacceptable, it's really your fault. And you cannot hold that guy accountable because there really wasn't a commitment made. And this is what happens all the time, unfortunately. Yes, Choice. Can we put this in the car business? Can you put this in the car business? This is what we have. Every Friday they have a sales meeting. And the manager goes, so Jimmy, how many cars are you going to sell this weekend? And the salesman go, I'm going to do five. Well, on Monday, he's got one. How do you apply this to that? Yeah, the salesman's making the commitment, but how do we make so, him accountable? Okay, so you guy, sales guy or anybody can honestly not make a commitment to an outcome like how many sales he's going to get unless certain parameters exist. So he really can only commit to what he d can do, right? And so he can't commit to outcomes because outcomes are not really within his control. Activity is within his control. So if you say, what you'd have to say to the guy is, I need you to take 25 ups, write up, you know, take pull 35 credit applications, which means you're gonna have to pull multiple credit applications on, on individuals. You have to get co-signers and pull their apps, right? And then you have to um, do so many write-ups, and you gotta do so many of this, and you do so many of that, and you do so many of that. And you gotta do that by the end of the weekend. Can I count on you for that? And he can say, well, I can't do that many, I, I can do this many. Okay, okay, and then, so that's the commitment. The commitment is what he's going to do to attempt to get the five <coughs> sales. Now, if your process is good enough, and followed that his activity should yield the output you want. Yeah. And so what you have to do is make them accountable to the activities that produce the results. And if he does the activity but then doesn't get the results, then it's up to the or organization to determine one of two things. Is the process messed up? Which ultimately, generally, if other people are using the same process and getting the results, the process is not messed up. Or then it's a skills problem or an attitude problem. And so then you can investigate that air, those areas. Well, you didn't hit the output, but you got the activity. Let's take a look at why you didn't get the output. Let's pull some calls, let's listen to calls, right? or let's watch, let's do a role play, walk me through how you would do this. Uh, that's not good, let's train you up there. Or you determine over time that this person just can't do it even when he get, it does the activity, fulfills the activity commitments, he doesn't ever get the output. Or he gets much less output than the other person with the same activity and he decides he needs to go, right? Or he needs to be moved to his different job because he's, his skill set doesn't match this position. And so it's a matter of making sure that the system is, str is strong and works and you're holding people accountable and make, they're making commitments to the activities which should yield the output that you want. And then determine whether or not if he's not getting the output, why? And what you're gonna do, what's your next course of action? Now you can't, you know, you wouldn't say like, well, if it takes, you know, this guy 
so many uh, so many interactions to get the output. So we're gonna because this guy doesn't get that many uh, that same output in those interactions. We'll make him commit to twice the interactions. Well, that's just wasting opportunity. We just got to figure out why this guy can't get the same output as everybody else with the same with the same activity and try to fix him up or get him out. Does that make sense? You know, you, you can't commit to outcomes that are not, that they, they actually have no control over. You only can commit to things you can control. Which is why when the traffic happens, that's not out of his control. He has, a, he, can, he, has a, he has a duty to respond to that in a certain way, which is to let me know immediately that there's a problem. But he has no control over the actual uh, thing. Now, the right kind of guy, in my opinion, would be like, hey, I want to let you know, I left on time, I'm sitting here in traffic, there's an accident. And it's going to potentially could delay me to get the result that we agreed upon. But here's my plan to try to fulfill anyway. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this, right? Well, there's, right now, I'm, I'm in traffic here, there's a flatbed truck in front of me, and the, the bed is down. What I'm hoping to do is get up to about 60 miles an hour, hit that flatbed, jump this, jump this traffic jam, get on the other side, get that hot dog in time. And you might say, you know what, that sounds, I appreciate your aggressiveness on actually getting this That's my demo, though. No. But I think you should try a different, I'm a little concerned about that method. Let's try something else, and if it causes you to be a little bit late, that's okay. Like, so that's a renegotiation, and the guy's got a plan to try to overcome the problems to s fulfill the goal. That's the kind of person you really want. That's somebody who's resourceful and creative and dedicated, and it, it, it takes commitment seriously, right? Accountable. Huh? And is accountable. That is an accountable person. And, Ultimately, the problem I find most often is because we don't do this well, we don't make commitments well, and there's a, we have a fear of accountability and a lack of accountability, we have no way to truly evaluate the quality of the people. And the people don't have a, an actual way to actually impress or fulfill in a way that's meaningful and impactful to us as requesters, right? And so we just kind of tolerate everybody because we can't really tell. There's always ambiguity in everything. We can't really tell if they're really any good or they're really trying or they're really resourceful or they're really committed because their commitments aren't strong enough. They're not, they're not solid enough. We're not sure of the, that commitments were made. And so we cannot evaluate the performance or the dedication or the ability of our people. The more clear this stuff is, then the more reliable, reliably we'll be able to evaluate someone and determine whether or not this is a person that can do the job or is, is right for the organization. Have you ever run into that with your, with your teams? Like, you're like, I don't know about this guy. He's like, mm -hmm. seems like he's trying, but he always doesn't get it right, never gets it right, and... I'm not, he's, I'm not really sure he's got excuses, and it's, all those excuses always seem like kind of logical or valid, but so why is it always their excuse? Like, and you just can't put your finger on whether or not they're really any good or not. Well, it's because we just, the, there's, the commitments aren't clear enough to really be able to have any kind of evaluation. And they're actually really good at avoiding accountability. Some people are masters at avoiding accountability. And... If, we're, if we have people that really aren't good at causing people to make solid commitments, and you've got somebody who's really good at avoiding accountability, those people can hide forever in, in, the, in the mess. <laughs> so once you figure it out, you can ching ching pow, and then you, it makes everything better. I mean, I know every one of you probably had the experience where you know, you've had a person that you like suspected was a problem, hung on to him for a long time, finally decided to get rid of him, and as soon as you got rid of him, massive change, massive improvement happened. Who's experienced that? Or you've hired somebody who was really good and immediately bringing on that person created massive change, right? And so the individuals 
who are not right for the organization, who are still in the organization, cause problems. And, and basically getting rid of them increases productivity. And bringing on the right people increases productivity. Which means the people are extremely important. Like, like it's the whole thing. So being able to work better as a team and being able to hold people more accountable because their commitments are clear and specific is vital because then we can determine whether or not we have the right people or the wrong people. Any comments or questions? Does anybody know what time this session is over? Aubrey? Ten minutes ago. Ten, ten minutes ago? Okay. Any questions before we wrap up?